Hey guys. Okay. We are here with season three, episode five with no big deal. Tony Quello, mm-hmm. the primary sponsor of the American Disabilities Act that was enacted in 1990. Oh my God. This is my fangirl episode. This is the episode that I've been talking about for like a year. Yeah. Um, you've been two. waiting for this one for a long time. And the oh. second you heard it, you were like, I want it. Let's yes. get it. Yeah. Now we finally got it. And it was even more than we ever thought Amazing. from amazing how you know his epilepsy story to the yep. whole ADA journey yes right and like i i was so nervous during you didn't look this... nervous do you remember you had to calm me down in the beginning you're like i, it's okay. I saw i saw like the <laughs> hyperventilating beforehand but once we started you were you were amazing oh, i was like oh my god and he's just so chill that's the thing is there's like nothing to be nervous about with tony he's just yeah. like a chill dude you know and very just open about his story and i think that's what like amazed me the most is i'm like you told all of this to people and he's like yeah and then what i love too is that he also acknowledges like you know, what to do when maybe your employer or your housing or whatever isn't following the ADA and like, what yeah. steps do you take? So he was just such a fun guest to have on. And I am truly, I'm still fangirling over the whole experience. I can't believe it happened. <laughs> I know it wasn't. I really can't wait for everyone to hear this episode yes. because yeah. it was like we say all the time, really eye opening for multiple yep. reasons. Totally. But yeah. He was really, really awesome to talk to. Totally. Yeah. Um, but before we dive in, we want to do, of course, our fan and fave of the week. Our fan of the week is David. And this is from a YouTube comment that he left. Yeah, we love when you guys leave YouTube comments. Please subscribe to our YouTube channel. Um, follow us on Insta. All of those things really help <laughs> us out. Um, and David wrote on John Bramblett's episode, who said, if only we could all see as well as John Bramblett, such a bright light of positivity. Thank you, guys. world. Her site, livingwealthepilepsy.com, is linked in our podcast description below. Jess is amazing. So um, yes, she she's is. also just like a blast to talk to. Mm-hmm. Um, and we'd also love to thank our sponsors, yeah. Norellis and SK Life. We wouldn't be oh. here without you. We wouldn't. You guys are outstanding. We love to That's- talk to you. We love that you're part of our epilepsy family. So thank you, thank you, thank you for letting us get this important information out to everyone else. Yeah. I mean, because of you, I got to have my fangirl moment with Tony Coelho. Yeah. Thanks, guys. Appreciate (laughs) you. Anyway, okay. We won't keep talking. We'll let you guys listen. Enjoy. Mm -hmm. Hey, guys. Welcome to What the F. We are so excited about our guest today, Tony Coelho who is the lead sponsor and author of the American Disabilities Act and currently um, is working on creating internet accessibility, of course, because Tony just doesn't stop, and then also founded, recently founded the Coelho Center in Los Angeles at Loyola Law School. Tony, it is I beyond words to have you here. I am so excited. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for joining us. Thank you, Landis. It's great to be with you. Oh, thanks. I remember the first time like I Googled the American Disabilities Act when I was diagnosed with epilepsy at 32. And and then I was like, oh, epilepsy's there. You know, I didn't know it. And then um, and then I was like, oh, my gosh, it was also written by someone with epilepsy. And like my brain just like exploded. So <laughs> um, if you wouldn't and like what the American Disabilities Act has done for me personally and for so many millions of others is unbelievable. Um but if you wouldn't mind starting with what your journey with epilepsy, how it started, what it looked like. When I was 16, I lived on a dairy farm with my family in Central California. So I was 
driving with somebody else in a pickup truck and he was speeding and we flipped over in the canal and I hit my head and you know, I swam out so it was not a problem. But I didn't think of anything as a result of this. I continued on. A year later, I was in the barn milking and the next thing I know, I was in bed. I had just had a grand mal seizure. And the doctor uh, was there and told my parents, later I found out, told my parents that he thought it was an epileptic seizure. My parents, being Portuguese and Catholic, had always felt that if you had epilepsy, you were possessed by the devil. Mm-hmm. And they sincerely believed that. It was not oh. something to they really believed it. Wow. And I always say at this point, when I talk about this, I always say my Republican friends know that I'm possessed, but having your family <laughs> think you're possessed, it's a totally different thing. But anyhow, they, they uh, uh, took me to uh, two other doctors to see if they could get a contrary uh, opinion. Uh, those doctors said the same thing. Now, as a, a 16, 17 year old, uh, doctors don't talk to you, they talk to your parents. Mm-hmm. And so I never knew the doctors were saying. And so my mother would say something like, oh, they think it's a cal- lack of calcium. We've got to find blah, blah, blah. And so it was always something besides epilepsy. So then I kept on having my seizures and my mother, we would show cattle at fairs and so forth. And after that, for some reason, she just forgot to submit the application for me to show. Well, what was going on, they felt strongly that God was punishing our family for some major sin that somebody had committed, and that it wasn't necessarily me. It was me having a public seizure that would tell general public that this family had committed a major sin. And so she and You was, didn't know this. You didn't I know, know that this was going on. Wow. And so, uh, so I'm upset that I didn't get to show cattle, but I understood, I didn't accept it, of course, and don't still today, but, but the fact I understand what she was going through. And so what happened is that my high school superintendent basically said to me that you got to get out of town, in a small town in Central California, and you got to go to college some place away because if you went close by to a community college or another, they would want you to come home every weekend and milk and 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 mm-hmm. control your life, and you want to get away. Okay. So did he know? Up, but he didn't know. He didn't know. No. Okay. okay. That, he, that was just out. separate. Okay. Really, and and so the I, I decided to go to Loyola University in Los Angeles, and I loved the Jesuits, and and that was who was teaching there. And I had a great time there. I loved it. I kept on having my passing out spells. You know, I once yes. seizure was over, I'd get up and do what you have to do. And it was, you know, kind of scary a little bit when you have the this yeah. seizure. But, you know, I just thought it was something different. I never heard the word epilepsy. And so wow. I, yeah. I just kept on going along. Now, I was... Sophomore class president, social chair in my junior year, student body president in my senior year, outstanding senior, all that junk. And I decide that I was going to be a trial lawyer. And I decide that if he could give up his life for trying to do good, I want to do something similar. So I thought about it. And at the end of my senior year, I decided I wanted to become a Catholic priest. So that was announced. um, And of course, it was being student by president and outstanding senior and all this stuff, it was a big thing for the Jesuits to announce. So, sure. so it was announced and so forth. So then I go for a physical. And Dr. John Doyle Sr. in Los Angeles said to me after examining and so forth, he said, have you ever heard uh, the word epilepsy? And I said, no. And he said, well, let me tell you what it is. So he told me and he said, that's what you have. And he said, uh, the good news, this is 1964, the good news is you're 4F, which means you can't serve in Vietnam. And he said, the bad news is Canada law established in 400 AD, you cannot be a priest 
if you have epilepsy or possessed by the devil. Now, through the years, people put those two together, right? All right. But, but that's what it was. So I was rejected. Well, I, I was fine with that because uh, now I knew what the diagnosis was. He gave me a prescription to help control it. He said, it won't cure it, but it'll help control it. I said, so I was thrilled. Okay. Yeah. So I be a priest. I'll go out and do something else. Right. How did he know? Did you, was it just you describing things like describing yeah, I just your stole him and He did okay. a test. He did some okay. tests. Mm -hmm. I can't remember what it was that so many years ago. So then I, I had gotten about 80 different job offers because of my uh, success in college. And so I decide, well, I'm just going to go out and do that. So I go back to the car and and get to the fraternity house where I was staying. And I call my parents and say, good news. I know what my problem is and so forth. And my mother says, no son of ours has epilepsy. Before you and, could tell her? Yeah. And so that wow. sort of from the, my experiences at first and now this, really started to separate me from my family. Yeah. Because, um, you know, I knew that they felt this way. And and the doctor explained to me what happened with canon law and so forth. So he identified what my parents were believing and so forth. So for me, that was all fine. But for my parents to reject it oh, um, yeah. was another thing. So then- It had to be awful. So that was all right, right? So I just, now I'm going to go out and get a job. So I start following up with these job offers. And in every place I went, there was an application to be filled out. And when I fill it out, I never got an interview, not one. And the word epilepsy was on the job application. And so I never got uh, an interview. And, and so... The first rejections are fine, you know, because, you know, I realized that, you know, there's reasons why. Sure, and after several, I realized it was epilepsy. So at that point, I started feeling like God had rejected me. My church had rejected me. My family had rejected me and I couldn't get a job. And so I started drinking and was drunk by two or three o'clock in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. And then I became suicidal. And so the day I was going to do the dirty deed, I heard a voice and it said to me that you're going to be just like those little kids getting on and off the merry-go-round. You're never going to let anybody or anything stop you from doing what you wanted to do. Now, was it a voice or was it just something that I thought or whatever, but it was real for me. Yeah. So, that's what's important. That's yeah. the only thing that matters. Yeah. yeah. No matter what it was, that's what was important to me. And so I've never been really drunk. I've never been depressed um, uh, since then. Uh, wow. And I got my mojo back, in effect. And I, to say the uh, least, yeah. <laughs> and I felt positive about myself and so forth. And then uh, two weeks later, I get a, a priest friend who tells me that the Bob Hope and his family want to see me. And this was an opportunity for me to live with him now. To live with Bob Hope? Some of your listeners won't know who Bob Hope is. But... Oh, no. Well, I, yeah, I do. Yeah. <laughs> so uh, he, at the time, uh, this is uh, 65, uh, 64, he at the time was the most famous TV comedian, as we all know. So I lived with him for a year. What? A, a great <laughs> year. So I lived as a family member, ate meals with him. It was a great experience. That's and, amazing. Yeah, that's crazy. <laughs> and so then one day, and I, so he was doing the Bob Hope Chrysler Comedy Hour at the time. Mm -hmm. So one day on the way to the the show, um, I'm with him, and he says, you think you have ministry, and you think that it only can be practiced in a church. You're wrong. A true ministry can be practiced in sports, entertainment, business, government, but you belong in politics. I never had thought about it. You know, I was in student government, but that's not politics. Sure. So, so that he, that's what he said. So I thought about it, and so I said, "Why not? If Bob Hope thinks I should. Why shouldn't I pursue it?" So I wrote a letter <laughs> to my congressman, who I didn't know. He, at that time, this is how lucky I've been through my life. 
he at that time was looking for somebody young with an agriculture background. I had that, of course. And so his chief of staff sends me a note and says, uh, the congressman's going to be in Los Angeles and he'd like to meet with you. So I said, okay. And I go there. And I met with him and it was going to be a 15 minute interview just to chat. We ended up talking for 45 minutes. And he said, uh, you'll be hearing from me. And I, it's fine, you know. Did it, you no, disclose you had epilepsy? Uh, yes, I did. I, oh, okay. We, yeah. So then what I didn't know is that my uncle, who was very close to the congressman, had and I had told him that I was meeting with, with the congressman, he calls the congressman, says that I am good, blah, blah, all that, you know, of his nephew, why not? Huh? So he, <laughs> he does that. Yeah. And so I get a letter from, from uh, the chief of staff and says, uh, uh, the congressman would like you to join the staff. And I'm wow. excited. You know, I'm just really excited. Yeah. And and so I I call Mr. Hope, and he's with Bean Crosby at the Crosby. Oh my god! And, this gets crazy and crazy. Yeah, yeah. Oh my god. Amazing. So I say, you know, I took your advice, and I've now got a job offer with the uh, as Congressman Congressman Sisk, and he says, "Who is he?" And I describe, and he said. Why would you go with him? I could get you with somebody who really has a name and somebody with power and so forth. Well, I said, <laughs> I said, well, he's my local congressman. That's that's what I really want to do. So he says, so I want to, I want you to come to Palm Springs. I want to talk to you when I get there. Okay, so we go, and so he is very uh, enthusiastic about my decision, but he says. I would like you not to write anything about our experience. You're living with us for a year. And I said, absolutely. Anything that you want. Yeah. And the interesting part of this was that at the end, he said, how are you going to get there? And I said, well, I'm in the car. I'm going to drive. And he said, uh, do you have any money? Well, I said, I have a little. And he says, well, you know, when you get there, you're not going to get paid. You're going to get paid at the end of the month. How are you going to get an apartment and so forth? And I said, I don't know. I'll work that out. And he said, no. He said, let me help you. And I said, no, no, no. I don't, I don't want anything from you. Um, I just appreciate being with you for a year, you and the family. Wow. And he says, after some discussion, he says, well, why don't you go to the local bank, bank of America that I use in North Hollywood, go there and borrow the money from, from them. It'd be your obligation. Oh, I said, okay, I'm happy to do that. So <laughs> I then go there and I walk in and the secretary says, oh, they're waiting for you. So I go in, or he's waiting for you. I go into the branch manager. So he starts talking about hope and so forth and so on. And he says, how much do you want? Well, I had not thought of it. I just thought, you know. Yeah, you're a kid. Like, yeah, 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 you know, I, I get it. A small little town <laughs> yeah. in from California. You know, I'm thinking, oh my God. So I say very reluctantly, I say, a thousand dollars. He said, a thousand dollars. And I go, oh my God, I asked for too much. Yeah. And so he says, whatever you want, we're willing to give you whatever you want or loan you whatever you want. I said, no, no, a thousand dollars is plenty. So years later, and I paid it off on a monthly wow. basis. Like, wow. I think it was like $26. I'm not sure what it was, <laughs> but I paid it off. And I got the card with his signature on it. I didn't realize at the time what a co-signer was. And of course, he was a co-signer. So we took the obligation. I didn't know that, you know, but yeah. anyway. So that, so my life has been a series of successes, mm -hmm. set back originally. But epilepsy basically has created who I am today. And I always thank God for my epilepsy because it made me a better person, a stronger person. Mm -hmm. And so uh, as I go to Congress as a staffer, I was the agriculture person on the staff. And I became very close to the congressman. And I'd have seizures uh, when he was around. And he would say to people, just back off. He'll be fine, so forth and so on. He was just wow. so, so, um, so kind and so understanding of what I was going sure. through. So anyway, he decides to retire and wants me to take his place, and then I do. During the campaign, my opponent at a dinner 
one night, uh, says to the group, um, I don't know if you know it or not, but Tony's a very sick man. Uh, oh, he, no. has, he has epilepsy. And what would you think if he went to the White House to argue a critical issue for us, such as water, which in Central California is the biggest issue, mm -hmm. so such as water, and had a seizure? Well, several people in the room were furious with that comment. I got calls that night saying, this has happened. Well, you know. Furious with you or furious yeah. with him? With him. Okay, okay, good. I didn't know if they were mad at you for not disclosing or, you know, well, it's politics. Yeah. It's so weird. I disclosed. I Okay. I suppose okay. Right. You were, yeah. Yeah. And so, so I was upset, but not much you can do about it, right? I was upset. I get a call the next day from a reporter. He says, I understand your opponent last night said X. What's your reaction? And off the top of my head, I just said, well, in the 13 years I was a staffer in Washington, I knew a lot of people who went to the White House and had fits. At least I would have an excuse. <laughs> and that killed it. Oh, that's, oh, that nobody, is amazing. I you know that was just off the top of my head. I had it was just. Oh my gosh! Okay. I'm going to use that from now on. Yeah. That yeah. eliminated. That eliminated the whole thing, right? No, oh, nobody's wow. ever taken out my epilepsy since. Then. <laughs> <laughs> oh my god! It got in People Magazine, and it got in. You know, I love it. It should. Well, yeah, and it's applicable to so many things. Like Lexi said, like. I'm definitely stealing this because <laughs> yeah. you can use it in so many different places. You know? So I get elected and um, my I had a, a love affair with my district. I, I, I really enjoyed being their congressperson and I won my races easily. But I always said to him, look, it, I'm your consultant and I have to be rehired every two years. Mm -hmm. So my view is that on the issues that are critical for you, I will do what's really important for the district. In this case, it'd be water and agriculture. I will do whatever is critical for the district. But on social policy, I want to vote the way that I think is right. And hopefully I can help educate as to why I did what I did. It was fine with everybody. And so I was socially um, liberal. Uh, I was tough on agriculture and water issues and also on budget and so on. But what it did is gave me an opportunity to do more in regards to disabilities and in regards to epilepsy. I realized as a member that you couldn't pass a law that would cover, like if you were doing housing, you couldn't say it, it includes disabilities because we didn't have basic civil rights. Does that yeah. mean like disabilities weren't clearly labeled at that point? Yeah, well, or... that's what ADA is all about. Yeah. So, mm -hmm. so that's when I started thinking about ADA. And basically with the Ronald Reagan administration, they set up a disability council, whatever it was. And the chair of that council was a woman from Connecticut. And the vice chair was a woman from Colorado. Roxanne Vieira is her name. And so when they started working on an ADA, they came to me and said, we're working on this. Would you consider working with us to come up with a bill? And I said, of course. We decided it should be bi bipartisan. So the Senate would be a Republican and the House would be a Democrat, me. And they picked a guy from Connecticut, Lil Weicker, who had a son with Downs. And so... Mm -hmm. It was Lowell and I who then put in the bill, mm -hmm. and I testified on the Senate side and so forth. It was a great hearing, and I assume you, the one you're talking about, um, but it's great. Yeah, I, I did watch it, and it is yeah. absolutely incredible. Were you scared? Because <laughs> you're saying, you're, you're telling a lot of the things that you've shared with us now, like your story, and like, like I, I'm like, I was like getting nervous watching it because I'm like, oh my god, I would be so nervous like telling all these people like all of this stuff and like the people that I work with and like in a time when it wasn't, yeah, you know, and it's when it's not now, when it's a not as accepted now. Were you? Well, room, how did you feel? Well, the room was packed. You know, I saw. Yeah, you know, the room was packed, and so I was speaking and and urging the Senate to support this bill and why. I had no trouble speaking because, you know, 
it's me and it's my experience. So I didn't have any notes or anything. I just talked. The, the key here is that Bob Dole, one of the leaders in the Senate, had a disability. In the House, May, with a disability, and I'm a leader in the House. So it the, all the all the points came together, you know, it was like yeah. if it had been somebody else in the Senate, I'm not sure it would have passed. But her anyway, Well, it takes people who get it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Who really understand. And and all stories, as you well know, all stories have an impact. And if they're real, coming from an individual, it has a huge impact. And oh. so my testimony was very raw um and to the point. And uh, and from there, I was now a leader in the House, and part of the leadership called me in one day and said, you know, this ADA is massive, and uh, I'm afraid that if it's adopted, the public will turn against us. And so mm -hmm. uh, why don't you break it up in different parts, and we can pass parts of it. Now, I was at that time uh, an elected part of the leadership, and so... I'm elected by the caucus, just like he was. And so I said, no, because I, you know, if I were yeah. not a leader, I probably couldn't say no, right? But mm -hmm. as, as a leader, I felt, no, this is, yeah. this is important. I want the whole thing together. So what they then did was to put it in seven committees and 15 different subcommittees to slow it down. So I then leave the Congress at that point. House in the Senate and overruled the Supreme Court decision, which isn't done too often. And we overruled wow. the Supreme Court decision, making sure that everyone with a disability is covered by the ADA. Why, why would they think that it's okay to only cover visible? My feeling about that is that they were all older. Yeah. They didn't know anything about epilepsy or intellectual disabilities and so forth. They only knew the disabilities you could see. That's how they grew up. Yeah. Because if you think about our culture, if you had intellectual disabilities, you had epilepsy, you were put in the closet, you were put away, you didn't yeah. talk about it, right? Yeah. And so uh, what we were trying to do with all these different organizations was to bring it up, you know, bring mm -hmm. you have epilepsy, uh, some credibility and so forth. But Supreme Court, based on these individuals' age and experience, they ruled what they knew, right? And so we had to then overrule, which we did. I also feel that the ADA covers the internet. Now, the internet was not a known commodity when we passed the ADA. Because that was in 1990 that it passed, correct? Yeah. Okay. And, and so we, uh, we put in a provision there about covering all commerce. Well, tell me that the internet is not commerce. Okay. <laughs> right? So... But anyway, 
the there's been a fight over it, and and some courts have said it does cover it. Other courts said it doesn't, and so mm-hmm. on. And eventually, it may get to Supreme Court. But when you pass the legislation, then there's rules and regs that are developed by the White House and the agencies to say what that bill does and doesn't do. And so ADA has been law for 33 years. But 13 years ago, we started to make a push to get the rules and regs established. So I have become a consultant pro bono for the blind, deaf, and physically impaired communities, strategizing how to get this done. What does this internet accessibility for the disabled, what does that so look let's like? Take, let's go back to COVID, right? Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, the four of us during COVID, we couldn't go out. So if you wanted to pay bills or order something, you could go to the internet, right? The internet gave you access to the outside world so yeah. that you could function and do things. Now, if you're blind or hearing impaired or physically impaired, you can't mm-hmm. move your arms and so forth, what do you do? Yeah. Yeah. You had to get somebody to. it will cover the internet. It's a big thing. And from my view, it's as important as the ADA because there's millions of Americans who haven't benefited from the internet like the rest of us do. Now they benefit totally. from sidewalks and everything else that the ADA covers, but not access to the internet, which has become more and more critical to our everyday activities. Yeah. Once this is done in next year at some point, uh, all state and local governments will have to make the internet uh, software accessible. Now, those people who provide this, the, ex- uh, the, the software that's accessible, they're not going to do software that is accessible and the same non-accessible. They're going to do a product accessible. What does that mean? That means, of course, in the United States, the law will be that you have to, right? These companies are global. They're not restricted to the United States. Yeah. So that all of a sudden, worldwide, there's going to be accessible uh, uh, internet for people worldwide who are blind, hearing, hear. And that's why I say that this is really just as important as the ADA. Totally. To, to get this into law. So that's what I've been doing uh, yeah. in the last several years and we're making great progress so i'm excited that's amazing that's so awesome like because mm-hmm. you know and it's so true when you when these like when the ada is created like like you said like we just didn't envision like the world as it is today mm-hmm. i don't think in 2006 we envisioned the world that it is today you know it just it yeah. just when the smartphone came out like we just keep i think that was 2006 maybe 2008 i don't know but we just <laughs> it just keeps getting you know growing 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 right. so it's like i really appreciate you like Taking like being like we have to adjust our laws mm-hmm. to, yeah. like, for the time because I feel like that just doesn't happen enough and so um, that's real that's just really awesome. And I want to say about this effort uh, is that the blind community, the deaf community, are the ones that are really in the grassroots making it all happen. So I want to make sure that you understand that I'm not saying I've done that. All I'm doing is I'm the strategist to help them uh, get it through. Um, they are really, they spend a lot of time on it. We do meetings once a week um, in order to keep the strategy going and so forth. So it's a great awesome. effort. To, these three communities uh, really worked hard. And the great news is that in the support for this in the disability community, we have 180 different disability organizations who support having this happen. And that's exciting that we're all together as a community. Yes, totally. When mm-hmm. when you can see that happening, you know, because sometimes there's this weird yes. uh, competition between nonprofits and stuff. Yeah. Well, and 
but like when everyone comes together for something, you're like, yay, we're mm -hmm. we're in the same well, the, in the past, uh, the disability community didn't work together. You know, they if you had cancer, you did your cancer thing. If you had epilepsy, you did your epilepsy thing. And yeah. so now we're working together on these things that impact the total community. Now, mm -hmm. something for each, you know, for epilepsy, epilepsy community will pursue it and others might help. But this issue is a big issue for so many people and yes. so forth. So anyway, but I want to do one shout out. One shout out is that we all in the disability community must remember that caregivers are critical for our ability to function. Mm -hmm. And we don't give enough credit to caregivers. Caregivers give up jobs in order to take care of people with disabilities. Mm -hmm. Caregivers work two or three jobs to make sure they can take care of people with disabilities. So caregivers, you know, a lot of attention is paid to those of us with a disability. Mm -hmm. But as a community, we could not succeed in doing what we're doing if we didn't have caregivers who do it. And really? that's really very important. I and love that. Mom and dad. <laughs> yeah. Wouldn't and be here well, without them. Well, that I have that makes me I have a question then for you because like as to what happened with the relationship with, with your parents. I, I struggled with my parents' relationship. Yeah. Um, and I felt uh rejected. I leave Congress. And I went to Wall Street, okay? So I met Wall Street for a year and end up being very successful there. And some articles are written about it. So the Washington Post uh, has this reporter doing a story on me uh, to prove that I'm not a success there, even though people talk about being a success, that I'm not really. He we he goes through and he's doing a research and he gets through with his, his article, submits it to the editor, and the editor says, uh, I can't run it. And so he says, why? He said, because in here you say his parents did X, Y, and Z. And I see nowhere in here where you say you've talked to his parents. Mm -hmm. So David calls me and says, the article has been rejected because I didn't talk to your parents. What would you think about me calling them? I said, feel free to call them. I have no idea what they'll say. So 45 minutes later, he calls me back and he says, you won't believe it. Talk to your mother. And she confirmed everything you said. And she said that they were embarrassed, but didn't know how to tell me they were sorry. I immediately flew home and thanked her for being open. The relationship improved, but you know, scar tissue is scar tissue. When she died at the burial, as the body is going into the ground, a voice comes over me and says, you got to decide whether you love her or respect her. And I immediately said, I love her, my mother, but I don't respect her for what she put me through. Mm -hmm. And I immediately had a grand mal seizure right oh, there, right there in the cemetery. We ended up uh, having a relationship, but quite honestly, the scar tissue was there and still there. Mm -hmm. Yeah, um, and it's hard for me to work my way through that. Um, yeah, that uh, makes sense. It the I really appreciate you being so vulnerable and honest no, no about that. I, you know, such a I, personal thing. And, and, and at the same time, as I said to you earlier, um, I thank God for my epilepsy uh, because yeah. it has been the vehicle for my success. Through my life today, I still am very involved in disability issues. I love it because it's who I am. Mm -hmm. um, well, I just appreciate your perspective, how it's how you hold so many different things. You're like, you know, this is hard and very difficult. Mm -hmm. However, there have been good things to come out of it. Yeah, you know? and it's like it's like you're acknowledging the the things that are bad and were bad, but you're also saying, but yeah, but some good things have happened. So like, yeah. you know, it's just it's just holding both, which I think is something that's hard to do as an individual and as a society. A lot of times we're just like, you know, it's either right or wrong. It's either black or white. If once you get to that point where you can say, you know, it is crappy, it is hard, it is sad, it does put you through a lot of stuff, but it also can be a beautiful thing that gives you a lot, a lot of, you know, more opportunities. I mean, grow. I wouldn't meet you two if I didn't have epilepsy. I wouldn't be here today. So, I mean. You're going to make me cry. <laughs> 
sorry. <laughs> we have got to get you tissues for these things. I know. But um, <laughs> but it, it does I mean, really, I mean, you have to keep reminding yourself that it does give you opportunities. It does produce beautiful things and it's not all bad. And changes your perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, And Lexi, I appreciate your saying that. Um, I really do um, feel that I've been blessed. That to me is all part of of my journey. Uh, the journey has been guided by epilepsy all the way through it, or, or you know, disability, but epilepsy in particular. I, when I uh, put in the legislation, I quite honestly didn't realize the impact of it. I knew that we had to ride for our civil rights, but I didn't really appreciate what it meant, what it what it would do for millions and millions of people. But here we are 30 some years later, and it's still one of the focuses of my life. Yeah. Um, and so I am still very engaged on disability issues. So, um, uh, and I love it. I mean, I absolutely love making a difference. But some people ask me, why do you keep being involved in disability issues. And, and my response is that I owe it. God and my faith have given me the opportunity to do things. I owe it to a lot of people that I am where I am. And that's one of the reasons that I set up the Fellow Disability Center at Loyola Marymount University in California, was to pay back and to help individuals and go through uh, that center and be involved. That paying it forward mentality is just really beautiful. It truly is, you know. And I just have one last question for you, if you don't mind. That's all right. Because I, I know in my experience, I was very lucky to like walk into HR and be like, I need these accommodations. I have epilepsy, you know, blah, blah, blah. And this is what I need. And, and they were met. Lexi and I know people who don't have that experience mm -hmm. where they ask for accommodations and then they're either met with like a brick wall or met with like a you're fired kind of thing what do you, and they don't have resources to like hire a lawyer or you know something what what do you recommend do you have any recommendation for when that happens because it just puts people like and it scares people into asking for the accommodations uh. the good only advice i'd give people is that in every state there's a disability rights organization, and you can go to them and they can help you out. Okay. Uh, and and there's, there can't be discrimination, and that's why um, uh, I always say it's important who you vote for for president because the president selects who's the attorney general. The attorney general selects who's head of the civil rights division. The civil rights division is the one who enforces the ADA. And we have had at times no enforcement of the ADA um, under uh, President Brent, uh, Biden now. It is enforced more than it ever has been. It has been enforced at different times of the year. But right now, the Justice Department, they're always investigating, charging, and so forth in regards to discrimination. They can't, Justice Department can't do it for uh, Lexi or for you, Landis, they can do it, though, if there's a pattern of discrimination, they can go after that. And sure. so, um, the individual things that either you or Lexi have, you can go to disability rights organizations and they can uh, they can they can be helpful. Awesome. Oh, my God. OK, oh, Tony, thank you so much for being here, for doing this, for taking the time to talk with us. Um, this is you know, absolutely amazing. It truly is. And we're mm -hmm. so appreciative. And we know our audience will be too. All right. Hope to see you again.